Hello. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to molecular orbital theory. Uh, I want to preface this by saying that this is a molecular orbital theory discussion intended for uh, students who are studying organic chemistry, uh, not necessarily a molecular orbital theory discussion for students who are studying uh, physical chemistry. So don't, don't expect a whole lot of uh, quantum mechanics and math here. Um, and if you're here, if you're a physical chemistry student, this probably isn't going to be a, a, a high enough level presentation. Uh, in molecular orbital theory, all atomic orbitals of matching symmetry can overlap to create molecular orbitals. And this uh, occurs, when this occurs, the total number of orbitals are conserved. Uh, so for example, if you have two atomic orbitals that are they go into the system, you get two molecular orbitals out. Four atomic orbitals in, four molecular orbitals out. Uh, I want to compare molecular orbital theory to, to the other predominating uh, quantum mechanical bonding theory, valence bond theory. For students of organic chemistry, you're much more familiar with valence bond theory. Even if you've never heard it called that, even if you've not thought about it from the quantum mechanical level, most of the bonding theory and understanding that you're using to, to help understand covalent bond structures in, in organic chemistry is valent bonds, valence bond theory. So in valence bond theory, bonds and lone pairs, you know, all electron pairs really are localized. Uh, the difference in molecular orbital theory is that molecular orbital theory is inherently delocalized. Right. So, you know, I just told you that in molecular orbital theory, all orbitals, all atomic orbitals of the same symmetry can overlap. In valence bond theory, only orbitals on neighboring or, or adjacent atoms can overlap. Valence bond theory uses hybridized atomic orbitals to account for geometry. Bonding uh, molecular orbital theory does not require uh, hybridized atomic orbitals. That symmetry element into the to the initial overlap equation accounts for the geometry of the molecule. <clears throat> valence bond theory works really well for simple covalence uh, compounds, especially compounds that are mostly uh, single bonds. Uh, or if there are, mar are multiple bonds, they're, they're relatively isolated from each other. Molecular orbital theory in organic chemistry starts to work well for conjugated systems. It also works well in uh, other branches of chemistry for uh, complicated structures where you have you know, more complicated geometry or you have multiple different types of atoms and you have weird bonding motifs. Um, and then finally, res valence bond theory requires resonance to handle odd cases. The cases that lead to requiring resonance are places actually where valence bond theory breaks down because valence bond theory wants uh, electron pairs to be localized. Resonance is introduced to, to handle cases where we know electron pairs are delocalized. Molecular orbital theory, because all of the orbitals are delocalized anyway, uh, does not require resonance to handle that situation, but <clears throat> it lacks that sort of uh, feel-good conceptual uh, part of valence bond theory that it's harder to pin down where individual electron pairs are uh, in, in a molecular orbital theory picture of a molecule. Uh, this is going to be the limit of my, <clears throat> my mathiness in this, this presentation. Uh, molecular, orbital theories, uh, molecular orbitals and molecular orbital theory can be thought of as linear combinations of atomic orbitals. Uh, and this formula here kind of sums up what that means, uh, where the Greek letter psi is a molecular orbital wave function, and the Greek letter chi is a atomic orbital wave function. C is a coefficient, uh, and the i's and j's refer to the different counts of atomic orbitals and molecular orbitals. So i equals one is the first atomic orbital, j equals two, the second molecular orbital. So C12 is the coefficient of the first atomic orbital present in the second molecular orbital. <clears throat> and then N is just the number of atomic orbitals or molecular orbitals. And again, there are four atomic orbitals, there are four molecular orbitals. So here's a conceptual example. Let's say we have three atomic orbitals, chi one, chi two, chi three. When these come together to make molecular orbitals, you're gonna form three molecular orbitals. So three atomic orbitals in, three molecular orbitals out. And you can write these equations, and if you're in physical chemistry, you'll be doing stuff like this and deriving those coefficients using 
mathematical models. Um, but I'm just presenting them here to give you a sense of what they might actually look like. And so for a hypothetical case, those coefficients uh, for the three molecular orbital wave functions could look like this. So the first wave function could be 25% chi 1, 50% chi 2, 25% chi 3. The second uh, could be 50% chi 1 and 0% chi 2 and 50% chi 3. And the third one can look a lot like the first one. And you'll notice that the coefficients in each column add up to one. You need to account to, for the entirety of the first of, of, of each atomic orbital and the coefficients in each row add up to one because you need you know each molecular orbital to, to be accounted for an entire orbital. So this is this conservation of orbitals uh, idea. All right, let's now talk about uh, some specific bonding situations. Uh, we're going to start with sigma bonds, and you may have seen a, uh, a diagram like this in general chemistry, where you know just the simplest of all molecules, H two dihydrogen, the two hydrogen atoms each only have a one s orbital. They have one electron in each orbital. When these things come together to make new orbitals, new molecular orbitals, uh, two atomic orbitals in, you get two molecular orbitals out. One of those orbitals is lower in energy. The other or or orbital is higher in energy. The overall sum of orbital energies needs to be the same as it was going in. Part of that conservation law. The lower energy orbital is labeled uh, sigma. This is our sigma bond. Oops. And the upper, higher level energy orbital is labeled sigma star. That star represents this is an anti-bonding orbital. That means you know, electrons that go into the bonding orbital, the lower energy orbital, count in favor of the bond order. Electrons that go into that higher energy orbital count against the bond order of the molecule. <clears throat> and then we fill the electrons into the molecular orbital diagram the same way we would fill electrons into atomic orbitals. Uh, we follow the Aufbau principle, so we start at the lowest energy and build up. Uh, we follow... Uh, Hund's rule uh, and all of those other principles from general chemistry. So we put uh, our electrons into the lowest energy orbital first. And so in, in H2, the only orbital that has electrons in it is the bonding orbital. The anti-bonding orbital is empty, so we have a molecule that exists. If the anti-bonding orbital also had electrons in it, this molecule might not be as stable. And then I just want to give you sort of a conceptual picture about what this process might look like. So here are two hydrogen atoms with their 1s orbitals. As they come together, they can make a bonding orbital where there's constructive overlap between the two atomic orbitals. And so now there is electron orbital stuff in between the nuclei. Or they can make an anti-bonding orbital where there is not uh, no electron density in between the nuclei, or there is a node in between the nuclei. I want to do a slightly more complicated example, uh, and I want to note that most organic chemistry students aren't expected to be able to generate orbital diagrams. It requires uh, an ability to think through symmetry operations, uh, and sometimes requires uh, a fair amount of mathematical computation. Uh, but I want to just show you um, methane, one of the simpler uh, or, or hydrocarbons. Yeah. So. In CH4, we have a carbon atom and a hydrogen, and the carbon atom brings a 2s and 3 2p orbitals to the party, and each of the hydrogen atoms brings a single 1s orbital to the party. Uh, and very quickly, you can see that, oh, this just got a bit more complicated. Uh, but there are four sigma bonding orbitals, and if you drew out the Lewis structure of methane, you would see four sigma bonds, so you should expect to see four sigma bonds. But likewise, there are also four sigma antibonding orbitals, and they're distributed in an energy uh, pretty much in a way that suggests that if you added up the energy over all of the orbitals, you'd average out the energy of the original atomic orbitals. And likewise, you fill these orbitals the same way you would fill them if they were atomic orbitals. First, you go into the lowest energy orbital, and you fill that one. And now, at the next level, we have three equivalent energy orbitals or three degenerate orbitals. You put one electron into each of them. 
before you put the second electron into to any of them. That's Hun's rule, right? And now I have placed all eight electrons into the uh, molecular orbital diagram for methane. And now on the next slide, I'm going to show you the eight molecular orbitals for methane. And they are starting to look a little bit wacky. So these molecular orbitals are the probability density functions for those wave functions. And this is where there's like 95% probability of finding electrons uh, for each of those wave functions. And it's, remember only the bottom four are bonding orbitals, the, the top four are anti-bonding orbitals. And so uh, if you're able to rotate those, you would see that there are nodes in the spaces between the atoms in the structure. Uh, so in the ones at the bottom, you see, you would see orbital stuff in between the atoms. Um, but none of these orbitals sort of look and feel like the valence bond orbitals or, or the valence bonds where you can feel really confident that there are four CH bonds and each one is individually between uh, a carbon atom and one distinct hydrogen. This is one of the things that in molecular orbital theory can can uh, cause some consternation uh, but this is how uh, this is this is how molecular orbital theory presents the bonding in methane now I want to talk to you about pi bonds I'm going to draw a, a similar kind of orbital diagram for pi bonds uh, where you have you know two two p orbitals coming together uh, form two molecular orbitals one of them's lower in energy, it's a pi bonding orbital. The other one's higher in energy, it's a pi anti-bonding orbital. And again, we put electrons in the lower energy orbital following the alpha bell principle. We have no electrons in the, in the upper uh, level. And so here is an example uh, of what might happen as two atoms with p orbitals come together. Uh, <clears throat> and I have shaded my p orbitals. I've shaded the lobes different colors. Um, you know, depending on your experience in general chemistry, you may or may not, you know, come out of general chemistry with the understanding that the two different lobes of p orbitals have opposite signs. These are not necessarily opposite charges, but, but like opposite algebraic signs. Like if you graphed them on a plane, one of them would be positive and the other one would be negative, like the output of the wave function there. Okay. If they come together, so that the lobes of the same colors or the same parity line up with each other, there's constructive overlap and you get pi bonds. <clears throat> if they were to come together with the opposite orientation so that you know, the dark and the light lobes were trying to, to overlap, you would get uh, instead <clears throat> destructive overlap and you get a node in between the atoms. So there's what the pi antibonding orbital looks like. Uh, one of the really important successes of molecular orbital theory is explaining some of the unusual things that the valence bond theory or even go all the way back to Lewis bond theory can't handle. So for example, oxygen, dioxygen, O2 seems to be like it's one of the simplest molecules out there, but its Lewis structures and its valence bond picture don't really fully explain some peculiarities for, for oxygen. So for example, extensive study into the structure of oxygen, we know that there's a double bond between the two oxygen atoms, right? The, the bond length in O2 is 121 picometers. The, the oxygen-oxygen single bond is 149. And so with that information, right, the, the Lewis structure that suggests oxygen has a double bond looks really good, but we also know that oxygen has unpaired electrons. It's paramagnetic. It reacts with the magnetic field. And there's really cool pictures out there. Uh, and, and if you had access to liquid oxygen, which is kind of a little bit hazardous to handle, you could pour liquid oxygen into a supermagnet and see it suspended between the poles of the magnet. Uh, and you could see it because liquid oxygen is blue, which is pretty cool. And so that would suggest that this radical kind of structure for oxygen is appropriate, but then that hides the fact that it has a double bond. Well, Here's the molecular orbital diagram for oxygen. And if you count up all of the electrons in sigma bonds, pi bonds, and the bonding orbitals, there's two, four, six, eight 
electrons in bonding orbitals. There's two, three, four electrons in anti-bonding orbitals. So that's net four bonding electrons or two pairs of electrons for a double bond. But because the pi orbitals are degenerate, these two electrons in the pi antibonding orbitals, one, you put one into each orbital before you put the second one into any, and so you have unpaired electrons up here. And so the molecular orbital diagram does a much better job of, of explaining this, you know, this kind of behavior. Yeah. Uh, in the rest of my videos, I'm going to show some simplified molecular orbital diagrams. I'm mostly interested, uh, and, and generally students in your introductory organic courses are mostly interested in pi orbitals uh, for conjugated and aromatic systems. Uh, and so that's what this is pretty much going to be about. But in principle, you could construct an orbital diagram like this one for oxygen for any organic compound. In practice, it's probably really challenging uh, until you get to physical chemistry. So thank you for watching.